Hey everyone, it's me, Dave Glanz, back for another tutorial for iDesign.com. Today we'll be making this helmet in ZBrush. We will be using some hard surface modeling techniques. We're going to bring in reference imagery into ZBrush and then learn how to export our model from ZBrush into Cinema 4D, where we will use Redshift to light and texture our helmet. So enough jibber jabber from me, let's get started. We are back in ZBrush. I've got my coffee. And the first thing I want to cover is how to bring in reference imagery into ZBrush. So in order to bring in a texture, you need to go to the texture menu up here and I'm going to drag. And the first thing I want to do is bring in an image plane. So I'm going to click on image, load image, and take one of these images I found of helmets. I'm going to take actually this one here and bring it in and it pops right into the background it's like the Cinema 4D's background object where you can just navigate around the viewport and it stays there. The nice thing about ZBrush is by holding shift you can snap your view to an angle that makes sense for modeling. So if I wanted to start messing around with the sphere I could navigate this way and hold shift and I could start just bringing pieces of the sphere to match the size of this. And I can move it over to the side to see it a little better. I'm going to actually go up to my light box and load up a new sphere. Just get rid of this one. I'll click no, don't save. Go up here and you go to draw. I'm gonna drag this menu over to the side. And if you scroll down, you can look at these front, back, up, down, left, right, reference imagery loaders. And I'm going to go to front back, click on here, and click on map one. And now I have a choice of any texture that I've loaded into ZBrush. This looks like a front view, so I could do that. And this time when I navigate in the viewport, it moves along with everything else. And you can see it snaps itself to a plane. So if I wanted a, another view, left, right, map one. And now I have a side view. So now I have two views and a bottom view. So you can see how this would be beneficial if you had a CAD drawing with multiple angles and you wanted to model or sculpt something. This would be very helpful. Again, you can just drag around the viewport and hold down shift and you will snap to an angle and I can start messing around here. I can hold shift again and I can start messing around with this. The nice thing about this is it also, you might notice, adds a little bit of a, of a transparency to your model. Right above these reference imagery dropdowns, we have opacity for the image and for the geo that you're using. So that's two ways to use reference images. Let's go up and open up a new DynaMesh Sphere under Lightbox, Project, DynaMesh Sphere. No, we don't need to save. We're going to go down here and click on one of these images. So if you roll over, you'll see you get a little pop-up. And over here, right under these images, there are a few icons that have to do with Spotlight. And Spotlight looks like this. Boom. And you'll see that when I drag in the middle of it, it, it moves the image around. I'm going to actually move my little Spotlight thing over here so we can see You'll see if I click, if I roll over the scale icon here and I drag this little wheel, it scales us up and down. I also have the option to play with the opacity. Let's go and click on the texture menu, click off and open up our draw menu, which you can access again from up here. We're gonna go down to our front back views I'm going to click on map one and go to import. And I'm going to be using a model that I've already created as reference. I'm going to pick this for a front view. And let's see how that looks. Looks good. Pull it back here a little bit. And let's go to left, right. Click on map one, import. And I want a side view. So I think this will work. So let's turn this way. And that's actually going to be facing the wrong way. We want it to be facing forward. So what I can do, I think, is go under my map and do flip. 
and now we have it facing the right direction. So we can go to up down, go to map one. I think this version will work. And now we have a top view. So let's try map two, import. So now we have our views and we can navigate around the viewport and we can see that I have a pretty good setup here. So we can start moving this sphere around to get a general shape of the helmet. So I'm just gonna start off with make sure my symmetry is on by going to transform, activate symmetry. You can also just hit X on the keyboard and you'll see that that deactivated it, X. And I'm gonna make sure I hit shift to snap to my front view. And I'm just gonna start pulling up the geometry here, pulling it down here, trying to get a general shape, something similar to what I've already done. And then I'm going to turn to the side here, just kind of mash this around. Trying to get the general shape of the helmet here. If you're doing this from scratch, you might actually want a reference inside here. So let's go into our light box and I'm going to go to tool. We could just use this demo head here. So I'm going to double click on that. It's going to drop in our tool palette over here on the right. If I want to go back to well, what I was working on, I can click on Polysphere here. That's going to take us back. And if I want to add that head, first I have to get rid of Lightbox. I can go to either Append or Insert. And I can append that demo head. So we're going to go into our little gizmo tool. I can go to Move and just bring up the size of that head. We could click on the Transparency button down here on the bottom right. And that's going to help us visualize this a little bit better. So we can see what how this helmet would actually fit over an actual human head. And I think that's probably helpful for this type of thing. I'm going to bring the eyes up to where the eyes should be. So I'm going to turn off transparency, go back to trying to mash this around. Make sure we have our polysphere selected. You can always rename this by clicking on rename, let's say main helmet. So now that we have our main helmet basically sculpted out, at least the, the shape of it, we want to start slicing this up in a way that's actually going to help us when we want to start some hard surface detailing here. What I can do is go up to my brush tool and let's bring down our draw panel and bring this up. If I click control, that's going to bring up our mask options. And if I hold down shift, that's going to bring down the clip slice and trim tools. I want to use the slice tool this time. What that's going to do is enable us to slice this up into different polygroups. Polygroups can only be seen if you click on the line fill button down here, where you can see the colors and the lines. You have the choice of actually clicking on and off the fill and line buttons and seeing each one individually, but I'll just leave both of those on. So what I'm going to do is start to slice through, you'll see this dotted line. Now, if I want to make a curve, I need to hold down Option, and that's going to let me curve just a bit. And then I can hold down Curve again here, maybe here, here, maybe here. And that should be good enough for now. I also want to slice out, uh, slice a little bit here where we have the eye hole. So I'll hold down Control and Shift and then hold down Option to Curve, Option to Curve again, come back, and the colors have changed, so I know I have three polygroups now. And I would like to have a polygroup also for this area right here in the middle, off to the side where the horns are gonna go. And I'm going to click on my, my tool here, my brush tool, and I'm going to select Slice Circle, and just make a little circle here, and I'm going to click on the floor so that we can just see the polygroups and what they look like now. So the advantage of polygroups, one of the big advantages is that you can isolate these areas and just focus on them when sculpting. So let's say I wanted to just concentrate on this little circular area here. I can go, I can hold down control, shift, and just click on that area. And now I'm not seeing anything and it's moving a lot faster. I can just move this in and out. I can just sculpt on that one area. And in order to go back to my 
the rest of my geometry, I need to shift, control, shift, click on the outside. And that looks like crap, but that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna worry about that later. I'm gonna go up to my history slider and bring that back. And what I actually wanna do is slice off the bottom of this. This is a helmet after all. We need a place for the head to go. So I'm going to hold down control shift and not do that. I'm gonna hold down control shift, go back to my curve, slice curve, and just make a slice through here like so. And now I have this bottom area. So what I need to do is tell these two areas to go away and delete them. I'm just gonna go down to geometry and modify topology. And we're going to need to have this delete hidden button available. And in order to actually hide this, these polygroups, this slightly darker green and this blue, I'm going to hold down control, shift, and double click on the green. That makes it disappear. And then you do control, shift, and single click on the next part you wanna hide. And now, if I were to go hold down control, shift, and click over here, they come back. We want that not to happen. We want them to be gone. So I'm gonna undo that, and I'm going to hit delete hidden. And so now, when I do the same thing, geometry has been hidden, it's gone. The next step is going to be to use our Z remesher tool to redistribute the topology in a way that's gonna help us with hard surface modeling. Right now, if I were to go in and try to mess with these polygons and extrude them, it would be pretty disastrous. So what we need to do is go up to, again, I'm in the tool palette, and you would go, I need to go to Z remesher. I'm pretty sure I can just use the, the default settings here, except for one thing, I wanna keep groups. So if I hold down control and roll over this button, it's actually gonna give me a little pop-up here that tells me what it does. So it's gonna remind me that if I have this selected and I Z remesh this whole thing, it's gonna keep these polygroups, these various areas of color. So let's go ahead and click this button, Z remesh. And you'll see it's doing something up there. And now we have topology that looks like something a little more usable. We have these loops, these nice loops around here that we can use. I would say that this area doesn't look that great to me, but I could probably use this area on the green. And I think we're in a nice starting place now for starting to extrude some of this geometry. The next tool that I want to talk about is the Z Modeler brush, which you can find under your brushes. You can either hit B or go up to your brush button. I'm just going to hit Z and I'm going to click on the Z Modeler brush. How the Z Modeler brush is contextual based on what your mouse is over. So right now I'm rolling over a polygon and you can see it says Q mesh a poly. What that means is if I already hit the space bar and hold, it's going to tell me by default, the Q mesh tool is active. If you're familiar with some of the modeling tools in Cinema 4D, some of these should seem pretty familiar. Extrude, bridge, move, spin, so QMesh essentially is a, an all-in-one hard surface modeling tool. It allows you to extrude and connect. And the target area down here is going to tell us that this is what we're able to work with. It's going to work on a single polygon, for instance, since this is highlighted. If we were to click on polygroup all, that's going to take this whole colored area here, the red area, for instance, or the green area, and it's going to work on on just that area. So if I were to choose, let's say, extrude, and then it goes back to single poly, and then if I were to choose poly group all, and go back here, and click on here, you can see it's going to extrude just that area, and it actually gives us a new poly group. So that I can start working on here if I want to, or I could start working on this area if I want to. So I'm gonna undo that. If I were to click on here in this direction, it's gonna give me an edge loop right there. If I were to click on this one, it's gonna give me an edge loop in this direction, up and down. The same thing applies to points. The default point tool is set to just move. So I'm just moving this around. If I were to hit the space bar, 
Uh, one useful thing might be the split function here. Let's see what happens if I do that. That gives me a nice little rounded area so that if I were to subdivide this, I get a rounded, nice smooth circle there. Let's try delete. So delete, polygroup all, and click. And there we go, it's gone. And if I want to add a loop around here, a nice extruded loop, we can go into QMesh and polygroup all would not be helpful in this case. So let's try poly loop and extrude just this section. Obviously this doesn't look fantastic, but I think we could use the point tool and move these points down a little bit here to get a little bit of a smoother area. So what else do we need to do? We need to check our reference. So I'm going to click on floor and zoom back here just to see how we're doing. So I'll hold Alt, zoom back, and we still have to create these ventilation holes. We still have to create this decorative doodad thing down here. So why don't we do that? I'm gonna hold down Alt and zoom in. And I'm going to go up to my brush tool and I'm gonna hold down Shift and Control and I'll get my selection brushes. And I'm going to use Slice this time, Slice Circle. And let's hold down here over the green polygroup and I'm just going to hold down and drag, and I can hold down space if I wanted to move this. Let's move it about right here. And I sliced a polygroup here. It's a different color. Let's turn off our floor so we can see that better. And I'd like to just get rid of this geometry. And the easiest way to do that is to hold um, the space bar over a polygroup and make sure you have delete selected as opposed to QMesh or any of these other functions. And of course, when you select delete, you have different targets. I'm going to keep it on polygroup all and just get rid of it. And now we need to fill this hole. So I'm going to click on an edge to do that and use the close function here. You have the option of a convex hole or a concave hole. Concave is usually on by default. Convex will give you more options. I'm gonna keep this circle option selected. And just to show you what happens, if I select polygroup columns and click and drag, I get these kind of uh, sun rays in here. If I were to click on polygroup rows, it should give me rows like this, which is kind of cool, but not what I'm looking for. And if I clicked on polygroup flat as a modifier, and I just click here, it gives me a flat group, one single color. And you'll notice that if I drag down here, I'm creating more edge loops. And if I drag to the side, it's pulling the geometry out. So I'm just gonna let it come out a little bit like this. And now we have something we can work with. I'm gonna select a loop here. I'm just gonna hold down Alt and just drag around here, drag a selection. And I think we'll just QMesh this. So I'm gonna hold down space, go up to QMesh and just use, you could use a single polygon and it should use everything that you selected here. So if I do that, it's gonna extrude. You can also inner extrude either one. I'm gonna just create a little edge there and maybe let's just worry about this selection here. Maybe let's inner extrude that with the QMesh tool. Let's actually see how this looks when we turn on subdivision. So I'm gonna zoom back and maybe just call it a day on this. Scroll up to dynamic subdivisions, which can be found under the geometry menu, under your tool palette. Dynamic subdivisions is a little bit like subdivision surfaces in Cinema 4D. So if I click on, it's gonna tell me that I need to fix the mesh. So, all right, let's go down to mesh integrity, check the mesh and fix the mesh. And now let's try dynamic subdivision. And there we go. We have something that looks Kind of cool, it has this goofy little edge here, but I'm just gonna leave it. Actually, let's try to fix it. I'm gonna turn off dynamic sub divisions here and let's zoom in. And I think we can use the Z modeler tool to actually fix this. So let's turn back on our lines and I'm going to have a very small brush size here. You can change your brush size by hitting S. I'm just gonna keep it very small. And if I get in very close, I can probably snap it right there, and that should help. And dynamic sub, that's a little bit better. Obviously these 
subdivisions here aren't perfect. I suppose we could smooth them out if we wanted to, but I'm just going to leave it for now. So let's turn back on our lines and turn back on our reference and zoom out. I'm going to hold shift to snap to the front. So we have these ventilation holes that we need to cut out and we can use our point selection tool. So let's roll over a point. Let's see what happens if we click on a point. And let's see that's way too high. So let's go back down here, make a little circle, and use one of ZBrush's fun tricks where I can just hover over a dot and click, and it does the exact same thing. I'm going to do that in all the places that I want on a dot or on a point, and it will create a, the exact same size circle and will be included in the same polygroup, which is very helpful. So I'll just click again and keep clicking until I have about 16 holes here. Looks about right. And now I want to just punch a hole right through them. So I'm going to select the polygon and make sure delete is selected and make sure polygroup all is my target and click. Voila, we have ventilation in our helmet. I think the next thing we could do is maybe add a little thickness to this uh, maybe this green polygroup here. The first thing I'd like to do is to maybe give this a little inner extrude, a little inset. And the way I'll do that is with my Z modeler brush. And we are going to roll over, select inset, and make sure inset region is selected with polygroup all. And I'll zoom in just a little bit here. And I'm essentially just making a separate polygroup in here, maybe one more just decrease it a little bit more. And now I want to extrude, so I can use QMesh for that. I'll go to QMesh, Polygroup All, and just bring this out just a little bit. And that gives me a little thickness to work with. And that looks pretty good. I could probably do the same for these, this blue area here, so why don't we try it? So the next thing we want to do is think about the horns here. So let's turn on our reference and we see that it kind of curves out like this. These little ridges here and this little detail here, but, and we also have this little loop around here that we could work on. But I think the first thing we could do is isolate this polygroup and just worry about the pink area here. So let's turn off our reference. I think the best thing to do is going to be to just get rid of this purple group and fill it in with a much simpler piece of geometry. And the way I'm going to do that is by hitting spacebar over a polygroup and make sure delete is selected, polygroup all, and delete. We could use our old trick uh, with the edge selection and close the hole, but I'd like to turn off dynamic. So I'm going to hit dynamic subdivisions, turn that off. Now I discovered something. So there's a bit of a problem when trying to close holes here. If I were to try to do this, hover over the edge, there we go, close, concave hole, convex hole. If I try to do anything here, it's not gonna work. And the reason is because I have a polygroup on the outside here and a polygroup on the inside. It's actually gonna help us to get rid of this inner polygroup. So I'm just going to hover over a area of the blue and click that, and it looks like it disappeared, but we can go down to our display properties on the tool palette and hit double and we can see that everything's fine. This is kind of like a calling feature of ZBrush. I'm gonna click back on there to hide the polygons behind this area. And now if I click on an edge here, we can close that hole and that's great. That's what we wanna do. And now we would like to extrude this and bring the horn out. So I'm going to close this and hover over a blue area, hit our space bar. I have poly loop selected, so let's do poly group all. And just pull out a little area there. So I'm gonna hover over this point, hold down space, do a move, zoom out. And let's see if we can just drag this. All right, look at that. Turn our reference back on, there we go. Bring it right about there. Okay, so now we need to add some edge loops here so that we can bend and deform this part. So I'm gonna zoom in 
And I will hover over an edge and pull to the, try it again, hover over an edge and pull to the right. And the farther I go, the more edge loops there are. Let's try to make them even, as even as possible. That looks good. And now, if I would like to extrude some of this, I have these nice edge loops available to me in polygroup form. Um, I think we could probably bend and deform this a little bit though. So let's turn our reference back on, floor, and snap to the front and go back to my, let's see, what tool do we want to use? Let's just try the move tool. I'm going to hit spacebar to increase the size, make sure symmetry is on, and let's make this really big. I'm just going to kind of move this down, move this up like this. Maybe this one can be a little different than the previous version. Maybe it can have a little curve here. It's kind of cool. Turn to the side. And I can see that it kind of bends in a little bit. So let's try that. Uh, maybe if I made it even bigger, it might help. Try to move it in a little bit like this. See how it's looking. It looks like it's getting a little flat. Let's turn off our reference. Might be able to, let's turn our reference from above. See how it looks. Move this back a little bit. Move this in a little bit. Maybe move this. Just kind of shaping it up here. Bit by bit. It looks kind of cool like this. Maybe bring the bend up here a little bit. See how it's looking. Looking kind of cool. We could probably inflate some of these poly loops a little bit or smooth them out. Let's see what happens if I hold down shift and just smooth. That might help a little bit. Maybe move this in. Just kind of shape it a little bit. Let's call that good. Maybe bring this down a little bit. Okay. Okay, so I think what we could probably do next is actually give a little extrude around the edge here. Go back to Q mesh and this time do a poly loop. Hit S to lower our draw size. And we want to make sure we are going in the right direction. So I'm going to look for that little red line. And it's actually hard to see, but let's see what happens. Here we go. Extrude from here again. It's not too bad. Maybe it needs a little edge loop in there to give it a little crease. So I'll go to my edge action, insert single edge loop. And maybe one here, dynamic subdivisions, and turn off the lines, and I think that'll do for now. Let's go in and add a little bit of detailing here to these loops with our Q mesh. We could do one loop at a time. If I, if I pull it out like this, and then I were to click on this again, it's going to give me the exact same extrude. So I can just do this on a few loops. Okay, let's call that enough for now. And maybe we can isolate this area just so we can worry just about this area. I'm going to go to Shift, Control, Select Lasso, and just drag around here so we can just concentrate on this area here. Zoom in. And I want to crease these edges here. So I should be able to just insert edge loops here. So I'll just go like that, like this. And let's turn back on dynamic. Do control, shift, and click so that we can get out of our selected view. Turn these off, and that's looking a little cool, like that. So now we have some creased hard surface detail there. So next up, I'd like to add maybe a little ridge around, maybe here and maybe here on the side. If we turn our lines back on, our polygroups, um, we could probably use a little more variation here in these polygroups. So what I'm going to do is go to polygroups. Uh, we have a number of options here. We could do auto groups, which will just put everything into one. I'm going to undo that. What I'd like to do is use this group by normals option. And when I do that, I get some pretty good options here. It gives me a nice clean polygroup for this area here and this area here and all these selections here. So having done that, 
I can hold down Control, Shift, and just isolate this green area here. And let's say we want to put a maybe a ridge around the side here. So I could go into my, my polygon space, do a Q mesh, poly loop, and let's see if this gives us something half decent. Snap to the front. It looks pretty good. And I'm going to add a creasing, knowing that just having it like that is going to be a little too smooth. So I'll face bar, that's closed. So we want to do insert single edge loop. Maybe a loop here and a loop here. Maybe a little crease in here too. And maybe a little, maybe a little crease in there. And if we zoom out and control shift and click, that's gonna bring back all the rest of my geometry. And I think maybe we could add a ridge to the bottom here. So I'm gonna hold control shift again, click the purple area, zoom in and Let's see if we can do the same thing on the bottom here. So click and drag and zoom in and add a little creasing to the corners. Like this. Zoom back and control shift and click again. And if I turn back on, under Geometry, Dynamic Subdivisions again, and turn off lines, I would say we have probably enough to work on moving this into Cinema 4D. So before we actually export to Cinema 4D, I want to split this model up into three parts. The visor here, the back, and the horn, so that we can texture each one of those separately in Cinema. But first, I'm going to turn my lines back on so I can see my horns and loop back around to this side. Hold down Control Shift. Make sure my Select Lasso is selected. Let's just drag around here to isolate the horns. And if I want to get rid of this geometry, I can just hold down Control Shift. Click, click, click. Just trying to get rid of what I don't want. If I hold on Control Shift and Alt and or Option, I can just drag around here. Red is going to get rid of the stuff I don't want. So if I circle around here, it looks like I have a pretty clean selection of the horns. There are two ways you can put this into one group. You can hold down Control W or Command W on a Mac, or you can go into your Polygroup menu and Group Visible. And then I'm going to bring back my other geometry by hitting Control Shift and clicking on the area outside the model. And let's split off this green visor by holding, by doing the same thing. I'm going to just drag around here and get rid of the geometry that I don't want by holding down Control Shift, click. And maybe this area too. This little ridge. It looks like there's a little bit of stray stuff sticking around. Let's try getting rid of that. There we go. So we're going to group visible. And now we have two groups that are pretty good and ready to go. I'm going to hold down control and shift and double click. And that's going to hide my horns. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to control shift and click. And now we have just the back of the helmet and then do group visible, click off that area. And now I have three different poly groups. If I want to split these into three different layers or subtools, I can go up to my subtool menu, go down to split and do a groups split right here. And we have one, two, three different pieces of geo that we can texture. Now that we have this split up, we can talk about GoZ. So if I click GoZ, it's actually going to open up Cinema 4D R19. And the reason for that is that under Preferences, I go to GoZ down here. I have the option to select a path to the version of Cinema 4D that I want to use. Unfortunately, R20 is, does not work with GoZ. You have to use R19 and below for this to work. So if I click GoZ, I'm going to go through my subtools, 
and we can see Cinema 4D is opening. Just give it a second here. And there we go. Since I had the horn selected, it exported just the horns. I could go back into the subtool here and do GoZ again. It's going to go through and it automatically takes me into Cinema 4D. And here we are. And if I click on the green area here and click on GoZ, now I have all three pieces imported into Cinema 4D. So that covers R19. If I wanted to export to R20, there is actually a, a plugin that you can find at this address here. And you can install that into your Cinema 4D plugins folder. And when you open R20, let's see what happens. And if I go into plugins, I can see that there is a plugin here called Pi Go Z Master. I can import from ZBrush. If I go back into ZBrush and select, um, say, this main helmet and go back into R20 and I click import, I get this piece of geometry. That's fantastic. Now, I have noticed there are some bugs with this. Sometimes it will import and sometimes it won't. I'm going to suggest that you use the FBX option here for R20. So we'll go up to Z plugin and go to FBX import and export. And all you have to do is click on export. And that is going to give us an FBX file that we can directly import into Cinema 4D. And I'm going to find my FBX file. Here it is. And let's just drag this right into the viewport. Click OK. And we have three pieces of geo, this time with subdivision surfaces. Let's just take them out. And now we have our helmet ready to go. So let's save this so we don't lose our work. Just going to call it main helmet. Maybe we'll call it main helmet. That's fine. OK. And we can start thinking about how we want to light and texture this. So I'm actually going to use the Pixel Labs texturing kit for Redshift. Some scratched metal would be great. So let's actually search for that because I know it's here somewhere. RS scratched. We have two that we could use. So I'm just going to select those, drag them into my material list. And there's another material here that I'm looking for, some rusty metal. Let's try that. And let's look for one more texture. There's this shimmering glass that I, that I kind of dig. So I'll close that out. We can just rename this. Why not? Horns. I'll call this visor. And we'll call this back. For the horns, I'm just going to use this, this rusty, rusty thing here. It's kinda, it kind of has a wood look to it. So I'm going to just drag it onto here. And for the visor, I'm going to use this, maybe just this scratched metal. And scratched and dented metal for the back. In order to set this up with Redshift, I have to go to my render settings. So I'm going to go to render and render settings. Make sure I have Redshift selected. And let's increase the samples here under unified sampling under the basic tab. Let's say let's make this eight and let's make this 128, something like that. And we'll open up our real-time render viewer. So I'll go to my Redshift menu here. Drag this tab off. Maybe just drop it right here for now. So I'll click Render to Render View. And right away, we have a view of what the uh, texturing is looking like, but we need some lights. I'll click on Infinite Light. Go down to Dome Light, which is Redshift's version of an HDR. I need to plug in an HDR into the path here. We'll click on this, and I already have, I believe, a texture, this one called sables.exr, which comes from the Manhattan Knights HDR pack, which I will put a link to. All right, so let's maybe shift this around a little bit to get an angle. So let's add an area light here and go to my light menu and click on area light. And let's just bring that up. Let's lock our camera here. Actually, let's drop a camera in. I'm just going to click on the camera and then lock my camera in the render view by clicking this lock button here, lock camera. And if I want to zoom out and I can 
just kind of move this around so I'm getting like a top light. And maybe we need a light off to the side, so I'll duplicate that by holding control and dragging and just move this off to the side. Kind of move this down. And maybe we can even increase the intensity here. Let's try three or more. Let's try something like that. And I, I think I could use a little bit more fill on this side here, kind of on the right side. So let's duplicate that light and turn it around. I'm going to go to my top view here and just bring it over. And that's probably too much, but we'll deal with that in a second. Pull it back, rotate it a bit, and maybe bring down the intensity back to, let's say, two. So we have four lights set up. I think we also probably want to bring the cubic texturing size down a little bit because I'm not seeing a lot of detail here. So if I go to my textures and select all of them, I'm going to go to my coordinates and then bring this down to, let's try 10, 10, 10. And now I'm starting to see some of that detail that I was missing, maybe even smaller, 5, 5, 5. And I'm starting to see some scratches and bumps in here. So let's actually add this into a connect object. Uncheck weld, because we don't need to weld these together. Drop these all inside the connect object. And then just add a redshift object tag. And go to geometry. And override. And make sure that displacement is enabled. And wow, that is terrible. So let's bring this way down. Try point one. Maybe this one can be point two. Our scale can be point two. And it's still too big. So I think what we're dealing with is a scene scale here, is that the helmet is probably coming in as a much smaller size than Cinema 4D is used to. But that's okay. You can either increase the size of the entire object, or you can use these small numbers that I'm using. Let's try 0.05 and just do the same for both. And I think I'm going to bring down, I think for the visor, maybe we can bring down the size a little bit. Let's try 3, 3, 3. See what happens, maybe even two, two, two. We're getting down to some really tiny numbers here. But I think that'll do for now. The last thing we want to do is have a camera set up and maybe add some depth of field here. So I'll zoom out, maybe make this a longer lens, like uh, let's say a portrait lens, 80 millimeters, sounds good. Change my angle up a little bit. I add a red shift camera tag and go to my bokeh settings and click enabled. And it's out of focus because we don't have a focus object set. So I'm going to just create a null and make that my focus object. Let's just bring it right into the visor. I'm gonna drag it underneath. I am going to do reset PSR, which you can find under your character menu. And this is gonna be our focal point for the camera. By default, this is set to one. Since our scene scale size is pretty small, I'm just going to do something like 0.2 and see how that works. Or maybe even 0.05. Maybe 0.09. One thing that I like to do, actually, is to use a bokeh image. And I'm going to use this image, this EXR file, this bokeh RGB 68. And that actually gives me a little bit of a different look. Go back into exposure and enable that. Lower this f-stop number so we brighten it up a little bit and maybe even change the camera angle. So one last thing I wanted to add was a reflective bit of visor here and the way to do that is with a big sphere. Let's just scale this down by hitting T and bringing it down. Let's get out of our camera view here and I'm going to go into object mode so I can just kind of squash this together. And I'm going to add this shimmering glass texture. And now I have this cool kind of reflective visor. And I think we'll call this done. All right, that's going to do it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy the tutorial. If you want to see any more ZBrush tutorials, let me know or let EJ know. You can find me on Twitter at Dave Glanz. That's G-L-A-N-Z. You can find my portfolio and work at DaveGlanzProductions.com. 
And of course, don't forget to check out iDesign.com for more cool Cinema 4D tutorials. Until next time, I will see you in the next tutorial.